well, let's start with the title. Uh, cherubim chariots. What, uh, who or what are the cherubim? Let's, let's start there. That's a great place to start. And that, that was one of the first things that I had to, that's actually the first thing, uh, that I address in the book is, is who are, who, who are these cherubim and what do they, what do they have to do with us? And, um, it really goes back to, it really goes back to the garden. And, uh, b- before we can really understand what the purpose of the cherubim are, well, it, it, I, I guess I can start by saying with, uh, I, I, I see things like angels and, uh, spiritual entities, uh, as synonymous with, uh, extra dimensional entities. I think spiritual and extra dimensional basically means the same thing, uh, when we use it in, in that, in that sort of context. And I, I, you know, I, we talked about that when, uh, when I was on talking about quantum creation. Um, so I use the same terminology throughout this book. And a lot of times I'll say something's extra dimensional and you could, put angelic or spiritual in there and it's it's fine uh but what it you know what it seems like is things that um extra dimensional entities or angelic or whatever uh they seem to be classified more by their job than what they look like uh because things like um <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> things like a, a cherubim they have different uh different I guess we would call them physical attributes from our perspective. Uh, but basically, you know, when we're, if we were to see one, we would see some sort of amalgamation of, uh, animal and human, but it's, it always seems to be kind of different. What really, what I believe really defines a cherubim is the job, uh, the, the task that it has. And it seems to be to protect. Um, so the, the first, uh, the first mention that we, that we see of cherubim in, in the Bible is in the book of Genesis. And uh, after Adam and Eve rebelled, God expelled them from the Garden of Eden. And after that, he placed cherubim in the garden to protect the tree of life. And uh, we get that from Genesis 3.24, which says, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Um a really interesting thing to know, and, and you know, this this book I really could call a book of speculations because I speculate a lot in this book, but uh, you know, there's always some basis for it. But uh, I I, I kind of went that route. But um, an interesting to know a uh, thing to note is uh, the word east there in the, in the original text. Um, east comes from, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar at all, so I'll probably butcher these words, but it comes from the Hebrew word kadem. And, uh, has a double meaning. Most times it just means east, you know, like the direction. And on the surface, that seems to be the right translation in the, in the proper context, uh, context. But, uh, Kadem could also mean, uh, ancient, aforetime, earliest time, uh, and beginning among, among others. Uh, the word Kadem is used to describe an attribute of God in, in Deuteronomy, uh, 3327, which says, uh, the eternal God is thy refuge. Um, so that word eternal was translated from the Hebrew word kadem, where, where east from Genesis comes, uh, was translated from. So that, that, that right there in Deuteronomy shows the timeless attribute of God and describing God as eternal conveys the idea he's, that he's outside of time, um, itself. He has no beginning or end. Uh, so that, that might help explain what, what I believe to be an aspect of creation that's not commonly considered I, i've heard chuck missler talk about it and a couple others but it's not you know you're not going to hear it in any church probably but uh uh earlier in the book of genesis uh in genesis 2 8 it says and the lord god planted a garden eastward in eden and there he put the man whom he had formed um so the word plana comes from or uh, the word planted comes from the hebrew word nada and means uh established and we see that word eastward again, and it comes from uh, Kadem again. Now, that could be conveying the idea that the garden itself was originally established in a place outside of uh, time and space as we know it. And that that's kind of weird. But, you know, the fact that the 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 fact that the garden itself has a beginning, it disqualifies it from being truly eternal. You know, it was created, so it had a beginning. But it could it could be showing that it originated from a state outside of the normal flow of time, or at least outside of uh, dimensional space. And that could could be an attempt to describe a place of a different space time than we're familiar with. So the Garden of Eden may have originated from a higher dimension. And if that's true, that could help uh, explain why Adam and Eve were expelled from 
uh, from the garden. Um, there, there's a theory, and I'm sure you've you've heard. I, I think I first heard it from Chuck Missler, probably that uh, states before uh, before Adam and Eve fell, they had access to all dimensions of created time and space. And at the time of the rebellion, there was a split in the dimensions. Um, then Adam and Eve were left, you know, fall into the three dimensions of space and, and one of time that we're familiar with now. Uh, and the rest of the higher dimensions became inaccessible. Um, and I always thought that was a really interesting idea, but I just, I didn't know how much there really was in the Bible to, to base, you know, something like that from until I really started, uh, looking into these Hebrew words. Um, but that that also might help explain the purpose of the tree of life. So before the fall, Adam and Eve were free to eat of any tree except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, and that means they were free to eat from the tree of life since it was already present in the garden. So if the if the fruit from the tree of life was there to to sustain their state in eternity, we that might help explain why they were denied access to the tree of life after they fell. Um, Adam was told if he were to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he would surely die. Uh, and that's in Genesis 2.17. So if Adam and Eve were to eat from the fruit of the tree of life after they fell, uh, they would have been in an eternal state of death, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, they would have been comparable to uh, a demon or fallen angel or something. They wouldn't have had any chance of um, redemption. Uh, so that... This is a long-winded answer to your question, but this that brings us to the cherubim and what they are. Uh, Genesis 3.24 tells us that the, the cherubim guarded the garden uh, along with a flaming sword which turned every w- which way to keep the way of the tree of life. Um, so the, the text doesn't necessarily say that the cherubim were handling the sword. You know, we might get that image in our mind, but it doesn't it, – it's not that specific. It only states that one was placed there, that a sword was placed there. And the, the turning every way aspect seems to come directly from the sword itself. It doesn't seem to be caused by the cherubim. So it seems that whatever that sword actually was, its purpose was to make it impossible for Adam and Eve to enter the garden again and have access to – the tree of life that that sword may have been what was used to cause the split in dimensions of of uh space and time it it, it wasn't until after adam and eve were driven out of the garden that that sword was set in place um and if that's true that 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 could help explain why the garden of eden has never been found i i believe it's possible that it exists in a state that we no longer have access to it's it's contained in a higher dimension than our own it, it could be that the garden is still here on earth but because of our limited perception we could w- walk right through it and never even know it um so i i believe it's possible and it's it's a theory a theory i explore in the book that uh the sword and the cherubim are still performing their duty uh, so the garden remains inaccessible. Uh, so that, that kind of helps explain where we're coming from when we talk about who the cherubim are, you know, and their, their job of protecting things or, um, and we, we see that in ancient architecture too. Uh, things like, uh, the Shadu and Lamassu, um, the, the statue of, ba- they're basically cherubim, you know, they're, they're called by different names of, in different cultures, but there are these statues that were placed in the, uh, palace doorways and things to, uh, help guard and protect it. Um, so really long winded answer I gave you there, Rob. <laughs> Man, I like, uh, you know, I've always loved the idea of the first lightsaber wielding, uh, character being in Genesis, but, uh, this puts it on a whole totally different dimension of, yeah. <laughs> of, uh, of, <laughs> of consideration. Um, fascinating. Uh, I, I mean, I, I deal with the Garden of Eden in my second, uh, video. Of the Yahuwah Triangle series, uh, but I, I don't, I don't really get into it nearly like what in 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 the direction that you're taking it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just talking about the 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 location of where it was, right? Um, but the idea that it could simultaneously still be existing uh, in its original Genesis state even to this day, simply uh, imperceptible to us due to the activity of the cherubim and the f- first lightsaber uh i think that's pretty fascinating frankly I, i'd like to know how much do you get into that in your book or you just kind of throw it out there oh yeah i i well i deal with it right right off the bat in the whole first chapter and uh because i i think it's it's you know good to 
have a foundation right in the beginning, especially when we're talking about like eternal beings and things like that. And it's something I, I reference here and there throughout the book. But uh, yeah, it, it, it all goes back to the garden. And because um, that, that's one of the biggest questions is, you know, where is the Garden of Eden? Was it destroyed in the flood? Was it taken up to yeah. heaven? And, you know, it, it seems uh, just on a surface reading, it seems like the Bible just isn't really uh, that descriptive of what happened to it. Uh, so most people pass it off as, you know, well, it's not that important or, uh, and then the, you know, a few that do research it, uh, you know, come up with different answers and they're all interesting. I, I've, I've read a lot of different theories of where it might be located and, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I, they're, they're all fascinating. I, I've always been fascinated with it, but when, when I really looked into it myself and, um, and, uh, especially, I mean, I, I didn't really look at it from this angle until after I wrote, uh, quantum creation because uh you know that kind of opened my eyes to that that whole thing and i i started thinking well you know when this was created um nothing was fallen yet what does it mean to be fallen because you know i i put forth the idea in quantum creation that it's possible uh when when the angels fell you know it might not be a falling you know falling from the sky to earth, you know like what we would think of as normal falling but it might be uh, like a, a demotion of dimensions, like they, they might have fallen to the fourth, uh, dimension. And, you know, we already talked about all that. But, um, so when I, when I thought about, okay, well, Adam and Eve were fallen, they were driven out of the garden. Um, wh- what about the garden? You know, was the, was the garden fallen? Uh, you know, the tree of life was still there and they still had access to it and, or, or uh, they still potentially could have had access to it if they weren't driven out. Um, the, the tree itself couldn't have been corrupted or fallen because it still would have worked as, you know, it was, as it was meant to. So if the garden never fell or never, if it was somehow shielded from that, that sin, uh, then it still might be in that eternal ish, <laughs> I dimensional no, state. You, you, I can't wait for you to see the second video. Yeah, I, I saw, I saw the first one and even, even that my kids were going crazy through the whole thing and I had to, I had to keep pause. I, I gotta go back and, and rewatch it. But, uh, what, from what I caught, uh, it, it, it was mostly the, the pyramid, um. Yeah, that one thing. was dealing with Egypt and the pyramid. The second one, yeah. though, it's, it's devoted to the location and, and biblical confirmation of the location of Eden. Um, but. That's awesome. I, I think. Uh, I'm excited to dive. I haven't read your book yet. I mean, you sent it to me. I just haven't had time to look at it. That's why I wanted to really talk with you. Um, because I think, uh, from what you're saying, it sounds like you're going to have a lot of really interesting insight that, that I could then add, uh, from you to the, the work that I've already done in, in terms of my understanding of it. And probably, yeah. probably vice versa. Um, because if what I've discovered is true, and what and if what you've discovered is true that's pretty hugely significant and it also and I know you kind of touched on Mount Hermon too uh I mean, we can get to that as well but before we go there I want to um uh ask you a question regarding the uh well two things do you, what if if they were already immortal uh, I I contend that Adam and Eve were immortal until they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil uh and that's when they became mortal but so if that's true and if they were already immortal, what would have happened or what would have been the benefit of eating from the tree of life if they were already immortal? The only thing right. that I, I the, right. Yeah, the, the the only thing that I can come up with is it might have sustained that, you know, it might have somehow sustained their immortality in, in some way. I, I don't I don't really know, you know, exactly. There's there's a lot of different uh schools of thought regarding that. Uh, but it also might have just been a, a an obedience thing, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, for all we know, for all, for, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for for all we know that that was that was the only thing that they ate. You know, we're not specifically told uh, that that might have been their only source of sustenance. Was was that? I mean, hmm. we're, we're just we're just not we're not told specifically. So there, there's you know there's different ideas about that. But um, yeah, I, I I I don't know. What do you, what do you think? Well, you know, I, I haven't given it a whole lot of thought myself. It just kind of popped in my head as you were talking. I, I tend to think it may have also been, uh, you know, the, the leaves are for the healing of the nations we read in, in the book of Revelation. 
Yeah. Uh, so, you know, could have been possibly, you know, what if they fell down or got hurt or something? You know, maybe, maybe it was a quick healing, uh, you know, fruit of some sort. But the idea that they could have been their only sustenance is, is also plausible, I, I would think. Um, it's just fascinating to think of. I mean, we don't, we don't got a whole, we don't get a whole lot of detail to, to work on. So, and I, and I say the same thing. Look, I'm, it's speculation, you know, yeah. where, where scripture is silent and where other ancient texts aren't telling us, you know, all we can do as researchers is look at the available evidence and try to put together a picture that we think makes sense. Um, but I just think it's fun to talk about, man. I just, yeah, me too. <laughs> so, and, you know, it talks about cherubim and then we, now beam or em. In Hebrew, where you have the I am ending, it, it indicates a plurality. Do you think that there was more than one cherub, or do you think that it indicates the plurality of their of of their uh, composition? Now that that's interesting too, because when I've thought about that, are are they separate, as in like what John saw in Revelation, or are they kind of melded together, like in Ezekiel? Yeah, um, I I think that. One thing, I dedicate a whole chapter to Ezekiel and really tear that apart uh, and and really try to explain what's going on there. I, I think for the Garden of Eden, if it was in there, if it was in its high dimensional state, they would have been separate. I, I think when John saw the cherubim separate, he was seeing them in, you know, like their natural habitat, I guess we could call it, uh, when, you know, in, in heaven, basically. Uh, I believe that the reason Ezekiel, why they were melded like that, why he saw it like that, I think he saw what, what is sometimes in physics called an extra dimensional unfolding, oh. uh, where basically, <clears throat> um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll get into that in detail later, but, uh, basically if you have something of a higher dimension unfold into a lower dimension, eventually there's going to be parts of that object that take up the same space as other parts. So to someone that has a lower dimensional perspective, like Ezekiel would have had, you know, like we have, we have a, a three dimensional perspective. Um, it would have looked like they were all melded together, and, and for all intents and purposes, they were. <laughs> all right. So, uh, so yeah, that's 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 what I think. Josh Peck about his new book, Cherubim Chariots. And right before the break, uh, Josh, you were talking about the idea of if we're looking through sort of a multiverse, uh, and, and entities are coming from the other dimensional uh, other dimensions, you might have something like an extra dimensional unfolding taking place. Wherein, from our perspective, it looks like they're melded together. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Interesting. Do you think you know when you look at the 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 uh, Ezekiel cherubim, you have the the ox, the uh, eagle, the man, um, and uh, uh, the lion. And I, you know, I was thinking about that a while back. I was like, okay, you know, if each of these sort of represents a, a different kingdom of life form. On the Earth, what's missing? Well, the the lizard, the insect, and the fish. Right. Um, do you think that Lucifer may have been of that variety of cherubim? You know, I, I it may have been, and I, I've I've heard uh, theories about that before, and um, I it, it's it's definitely interesting. There may have been a fifth. Uh, a fifth cherubim there and uh or even sixth and seventh if we if we add in the fish and insect and, and if that's true if if that um here here's something if that's true <laughs> and if those are like I, I don't know what you'd call them species <laughs> the 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 types of of uh yeah of uh fallen uh angels may, maybe that helps explain the the Supposed reptilian aliens, right. the uh, the mantids, yeah. and uh, I mean even even the, uh, the 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 ancient fish gods like Dagon and and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. That that was my thinking on it. It's like, well, you know, why is it when we hear people talk about so-called alien abduction, they are already they, they seem to be of those variety. Yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. That, that's something I've often wondered about, and uh, you know, I, I get the reptilian thing. The, the the mantis ones though I I don't know what to do with I the the closest thing that I can find in scripture is locust but you know locust and mantis I don't know how close those really are but uh, I I don't I don't know what to do with them <laughs> yeah well it's fascinating uh, so uh, several months back well actually man I was almost a year ago now 
uh, I was able to go to New Jersey and uh, participate in an Ancient Aliens conference where it was the guys from Ancient Aliens, and I was sort of the token Christian there with a different perspective <laughs> uh, brought in because the event coordinator was a believer, uh, David Stinnett. And uh, uh, he said, you know, I think they, they're ready for our perspective, you know. And in the course of the dialogue with these people, I mean, even the secular – UFO alien researcher is coming to the conclusion that we may be dealing more with extra dimensional yeah. rather than extraterrestrial. Uh, talk. What's the difference between the extra terrestrial hypothesis and the extra dimensional hypothesis? Yeah, absolutely. And that right there is the key because if you if you can convince somebody to at least explore the the possibility of it, of them being extra dimensional, you're just that much closer to yeah. getting them to. Uh, except the possibility of a spiritual existence because they are they are synonymous i i 'm fully convinced of that now uh, so the extra the extra terrestrial hypothesis is the more mainstream um, uh, interpretation of what uFOs and their pilots are they the, the most people in the world that that look into this stuff believe that they're um, you know beings from another planet uh, so extra terrestrial. Uh, and that you know they're coming here for whatever reason. The uh, uh, the less popular hypothesis is called the extra dimensional hypothesis or EDH. Um, sometimes it's called interdimensional hypothesis, but that's a bit of a mis uh, misnomer. Um, if they're if they're like for sake of argument, if there were um, extraterrestrial species out there in the universe, they could have inter interdimensional capabilities if something is uh truly extra dimensional it means their origin is is from outside of our uh, dimensions of space and time mm -hmm. so that that the extra dimensional hypothesis uh is uh is the one that says that these things are most likely from outside of our dimension rather than from another planet and, and there's a lot of good reasons to believe that for 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 one thing just I and I, I I talked a little bit about this in quantum creation. I talk a lot about it in this one. It's just more plausible to believe that something of a higher dimension is visiting us, which for them would really not require a whole lot of uh, of technology. I mean, you know, they they'd probably be more advanced than us, sure, but it, it wouldn't require a whole lot, and it and it wouldn't require breaking of any physics for for. Uh, um, an extraterrestrial race to get here from however far away, you know, that they, they say they're reticuli, let's say, because they're uh, the small grays that like to say that they're from there. You, you would have to break so many laws of physics. It's just ridiculous. It, it's it's more plausible to believe. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's completely impossible. I mean, from a biblical perspective, I would say, yeah, it's impossible. But just from a straight scientific, you know, Sure, maybe scientifically it's theoretically possible that a race could have, you know, advanced to godlike proportions and can do all this stuff. But when we have two possibilities, uh, it just makes more sense to go with what is more likely, what's more simple, you know, Occam's razor. Um, and that, e e e while it might sound more out there, the extra dimensional hypothesis is the simpler one, the easier one, and the one that best explains what people are seeing and experiencing. I, I mean, uh, people are being pulled through walls. Uh, people are, people are seeing, uh, UFOs that look solid, but change shape. Um, they're, they're able to, uh, disappear and reappear, uh, sometimes even show up in, in two places at once. Um, you know, and it's kind of interesting because when you go down to a subatomic level on a quantum level and look at, uh, look at particles, um, like in, in the nucleus of an atom, uh, those particles are doing the same things that the, that these UFOs are doing. You know, they're they're popping in and out of place. They're showing up in two places at once. And physicists will say, well, those particles are doing that because they're operating in uh, in, in extra dimensions. Well, why not the same for UFOs? So <laughs> that's uh, that, that that's what I really explored, and not just from a scientific perspective, but from a biblical perspective too. Um, but I, I also wanted to write this in a way that would be uh, acceptable and not alienate non-believers. You know, and I, I believe that I wrote this in a way that a non-believer can pick it up, read it, and not be, 
you know, they'll, they'll probably learn a couple new things about the Bible, but it, it's not preachy. It's not filled with, you know, all, all the, all the Christianese and, you know, things like that. So it, it's accessible to everybody, but, uh, I, I wanted to really look at the, the EDH from, from those two perspectives and see, see what I could come up with. And, uh, from a biblical perspective and a scientific perspective, uh, it both seems to agree that the EDH is the most likely one. So that, that's really, that's the difference between the two. And that's what led me to, uh, write about that. Excellent. So it appears that, um, these extra dimensional beings, angels, cherubim, what have you, uh, or for that matter, God himself, uh, travel in some sort of um object yeah a, a ch- uh, chariots of the gods as van, von daniken would say um w- what conclusions did you come to in that regard i mean i, I believe that i don't you know, when i look up and see stuff it, it is an unidentified flying object yeah um you know that's all it means i mean it could be a weather balloon it could be anything you know whatever it's unidentified we don't know what it is but when you say UFO today in pop culture, everybody automatically goes to grays and zeta reticuli and whatnot. But if you can steer them in the EDH mode and say, well, no, these entities uh, also have craft. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, uh, it, it really works to our benefit, too, that there are non-believing researchers uh, like Jacques Vallée is a great one uh, that – that talks about the the EDH and you know those are, are great references to cite too when having a, a discussion with somebody who, who might not be a believer, <clears throat> but um, yeah they definitely seem to have some type of craft and and what uh, you know it's it's funny proponents of the ancient astronaut theory really love to go to Ezekiel because <laughs> yeah. they you know they believe that there's a spaceship in there and, and in, in a way there is I mean not not to what they're saying because they they butcher the text most times but but uh you know when you when you look at it when you really look at what those wheels within wheels are that this was this was one of the most phenomenal things uh one of i mean there was a lot of phenomenal things that came up in in researching for this book but this was one that that really stuck with me and got me excited um, I, I've heard I've heard a, a theory that states that UFOs, uh, at least some of them, aren't mechanical at all, but are actually uh, biological. And it's not a real popular theory, but there are some that that believe that. And you know, I've I've heard it, and I never really gave it much thought. But that theory sees UFOs as actual living biological entities. So what we see as a metallic craft would uh, be nothing more than you know a body for the consciousness or spirit inside, whatever you want to call it. Um, so the more popular version of that theory states that UFOs could be part biological and part mechanical. Um, now this is all within the ETH, the extraterrestrial hypothesis. Uh, there are a few that believe that. Um, and the idea is that a race of, you know, super intelligent extraterrestrials have found a way to meld living material with non-living physical components. And, you know, it doesn't seem that far fetched because we're kind of doing that even in, in our, our own culture. But, um, the, the theory there, the, uh, the other, the other theory, the, the, states that it's all biological and that's the really unpopular one um and that's less recognized as a viable explanation uh but when we look at ezekiel the idea that an extra dimensional craft is alive that's not really a new concept at all it, it's thousands of years old um ezekiel described the chariot of the uh throne of god as being made of living entities uh it's even spoke about in the book of psalms in psalm uh, eighteen ten. it says uh, speaking about God, it says, and he rode upon a cherub and did fly, yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. Um, now, you know, when we look, when we look at Ezekiel's account, um, and I, I could easily take up the rest of the show just talking about that, but I won't. Um, the UFOs that are commonly reported really don't look anything like what Ezekiel reported. Uh, you know, there's, there's one aspect though of that heavenly chariot. Uh, that does hold a certain resemblance and it might provide more information, um, as to if these things are living or not. Uh, so, let's see, this would be, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 15, uh, well, 15 through 17, I'm gonna read this as fast as I can, 
uh, talks about the wheels. It says, Now I beheld the living creatures. Behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures and its four, with his four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, and they uh, four had one likeness, and their appearance was, and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. So the word wheels there is actually translated from uh, the Hebrew word ophan, which uh, when you pluralize that, we get we get the word ophanim. Now, by itself, the word the Hebrew word ophanim just means wheels, and there's nothing really extraordinary about it. But uh, a lot of times that it's just used for regular, you know, earthly wheels like found on chari- normal human-made chariots. Um, uh, we even see that word that it describes the wheels of the ten bases beneath the lavers in Solomon's temple. Uh, but when we take the context of this passage in Ezekiel, he's he's describing something totally different than earthly man-made wheels. He's describing an actual extra-dimensional living being. Um, there there is a there is a class of angels called the Ophanim, um, and they were called that because they look like wheels. You know, like when we uh, when we say flying saucer. Um, we know we're talking about, you know, a uh, alien spaceship or whatever, but I could take a saucer from my cupboard and throw it in the air and technically it's still a flying saucer, you know, so <laughs> it's funny put that because it looks like that. Yeah, exactly. And, and so it just depends on the context that it's used. Um, when Ezekiel uses the word wheels here, he's not talking about <laughs> earthly wheels. He's, he's, a, it's actually a, a class of, uh, a class of angel. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, we get more, um, description. It says, uh, in, in verse 18, uh, for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. So they had, uh, they had eyes and those are literal eyes. Uh, even the word rings there comes from the Hebrew word gab, which means the rim of a wheel. So he's definitely describing something that looked like a wheel. Uh, it just wasn't at all earth, earth made. Um, there, now, there's an interpretation of that, uh, talking about the eyes, that says that they were most likely, you know, windows of a craft or something like that. You, you know, proponents of ancient astronaut theory love to, love to say that. And, you know, at first that might seem plausible. And uh, i, I got to give credit to Dr. Michael Heiser for this one because he brought this to my attention uh, in, in one of his videos. Uh, Ezekiel... Um, if he was trying to describe windows, he could have used the Hebrew word shalom, which actually means window. <laughs> he had access to words that meant window and door and, you know, all, all these things he could have used. And he didn't. He didn't use any of them. He used eyes. Like if I'm if I'm describing my car door, I'm not going to say it's I, you know, people would think I was nuts. But <laughs> I would just say it's window. And it was the same in Ezekiel's time. He had words for all that. So I believe when he when he said eyes, he literally means eyes. Um, so uh, when we go further into the chapter, we learn more about the wheels and it, it gives a lot of, I, I'm not going to read all it. There's a lot in there, but it gives a lot of, uh, you know, description and it tells us the true nature of the Ophanim there. They weren't inanimate wheels. They were actually alive. And we know this because Ezekiel tells us that the spirit of the living creatures was in, in the wheels. And that's from Ezekiel, uh, chapter one, verse 21 it says the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So the wheels themselves acted as like a, a type of body for the spirits, but the wheels themselves were alive too. So it wasn't just an extra dimensional, mechanical construct the the wheels actually had life in them Mm. um and you know there's ancient there there, like the book of enoch talks about the ophanim as a specific class of angel and i i put i put the whole passage in the book i'm not going to read it because it's long but uh uh, i i have that in there so the idea that the ophanim being an actual class of angel that that's really not i mean it was new to me but that's not a new uh New idea. Uh, the Sephardic Jewish philosopher and astron- uh, astronomer Maimonides wrote that the Ophanim are the second class in a hierarchy of angel. Uh, Pseudo Dionysus in the fourth or fifth century wrote that the Ophanim were among the first sphere of angelic hierarchy. You know, so this show that all, all this shows is that it's not a new idea. This isn't something that I'm just you know coming up with and trying to trying to make it fit. <laughs> um, but there, but what you're saying, these guys are. are referring to these as a as a in in terms of um um authority or um 
what's yeah. the word I'm looking for? They 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 rank they're higher they're higher ranking classes of angels. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If if there's an angelic hierarchy, they're um well they you know different different people throughout history put them in different spots, but they're basically they're pretty up there. They're they're almost uh they're they're basically right below the cherubim themselves. Um so they're there was there there's one last point with the whole uh wheels thing um uh it, you know it's been recorded or reported excuse me that uh Ben Rich the director of Lockheed Skunk Works from 1975 to 1991 he he actually admitted publicly that not only are UFOs real but that they're powered by a type of ESP um if that's true that that might be an example of man's uh, what I would say, man's crude attempt of understanding something spiritual through a scientific lens. You know, imagine if we saw today what Ezekiel saw, you know, in the ancient past. If we saw the cherubim seem to move the wheels without touching them, uh, we might assume that it was by a form of ESP. But instead of thinking of it as a power from the mind, maybe we should be thinking of it as a power from the spirit. Right. Uh, you know, when, uh, and, and there have been reports of that. You know, a lot in, in ufology that, um, that they're powered somehow by the, the alien being's mind. It might not be the mind. It might be the spirit because that, that's what Ezekiel described as these cherubim powered the, these, uh, the, the spirit was, you know, in the wheels, but the, the wheels themselves were its own entity as well. Um, so, uh, the spirit itself, you know, might be the pilot and the, the vehicle as its body. So I, the way that I look at that is it might be the some of these UFOs that that are reported it might be a a fallen version of what Ezekiel saw. You know what Ezekiel, Ezekiel saw the good guys. You know those, those were the the angels of God. But if different angels from different classes or, or choirs or whatever you want to call them, if, if different species of angel fell maybe uh maybe some of the Ophanim fell as well and that that might be what some i don't think all but at, at least some of these uh these ufos might actually be yeah you know i would agree with that completely especially and it looks like you get into this i haven't read it uh but it looks like you get into the vimanas and all that kind of stuff you know in the ancient record uh and even not that far that not that long ago i mean in, in American history, even, uh, you have these various depictions of, of, of people writing about what appears to be UFO fights. Uh, yeah. You know, S S Star Wars, basically. Uh, ships firing at each other, uh, and whatnot. So, you know, I think when, when a lot of people, you say fallen angel, they automatically think it's a whole different type of angel. That, it, that it's a, this is an evil, you know, pointy, horned and tail ugly angel compared to the pretty angel with the white wings but the reality of it is that they were all godly at one time they, they yeah, were, yeah the only there's nothing physically different between a fallen angel and a good angel exactly the, the difference is their, their heart attitude and rebellion you know what they did you, you and i are human beings we look exactly the same Yep. Um, but our, our choices determine, you know, whether we're good guys or bad guys. Um, so it, to, to the naked eye, uh, they would be, we wouldn't know the difference until we saw whatever the, it was that they were doing, what their activity was. Cause I know, um, Gary Stearman took a bit of flack for coming out and suggesting that they were, uh, quote unquote good aliens. Of course, he's talking about angels also. Yeah. Uh, 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 cause he describes a UFO encounter. Where he was flying a single engine plane and he believed that this UFO came alongside him and supernaturally kept his plane in the air when it should have fallen from the sky because of a, I forget, some kind of belt or something in the engine had, uh, fallen off and broken loose or whatever. Um, but I mean, that makes per perfect sense to me. Yeah. That there would be good ones and there would be bad ones. They would look indistinguishable to us we wouldn't know the difference in, until whatever activity that they decided to manifest would reveal you know whether they're good guys or bad guys exactly i couldn't agree more it's just like if you were to look at a believer and a non-believer you know just just by looks alone all you can tell is that they're both human <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and it's i believe it's the same with the angels i believe it's you know the same with the the cherubim the ophanim you know whatever whatever class angel you're looking at um 
you're you're not you're not really going to be able to tell just by just by looking at him. Uh, and that that's why it says that even Satan, you, you know, Satan masquerades as an angel of light, that kind of thing. That's how he's able to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, how far? I mean, I see you got chapter two is you know dedicated to uh, the Vimanas and all that kind of stuff. Do you really get into? Uh, the battles and stuff that the, the ancient world, uh, cultures were writing about, or where did you go with that? Yeah, I, I mostly, uh, yeah, we deal with that, and I, I mostly, I mostly dealt with the actual, um, descriptions of these Vimana to show, cause, you know, a lot, a lot of, uh, ancient astronaut theorists will use, um, the Mahabharata and things like that to show, well, you know, their ET craft. But even those texts, it's not, it's not extraterrestrial. They are described as extra dimensional. You know, it doesn't use that word, but when we, when we look at them, um, you know, a really good example is in the Mahabharata, we, uh, find a description of a chariot called the Pushpaka. Um, and, it, you know, it, it's interesting that Sanskrit word has a variety of meanings and one of them is, uh, a kind of serpent. Mm. So I, I thought that was, that was interesting. Um, and there's there's other def- definitions as well, but um, so in uh, it it says uh, in the Mahabharata, um, and he rode on that beautiful and sky ranging chariot called the Pushpaka that was capable of going everywhere at the will of the rider, uh, and I, I think that that's interesting wording, you know, at the will of the rider. That might that might be like the the spirit slash ESP kind kind of thing we were talking about before, um, but we also uh, we also learn of the origins. It said the Lord of Treasures sat on that excellent seat, the elegant Pushpaka constructed by Viswakarma, uh, painted with diverse colors. And I go, I, I deal with all of that in the book of who, uh, uh, Viswakarma was. And I, I actually believe that that might be Satan. Um, because interestingly enough, uh, this is a tangent, but, um, Viswakarma is sometimes referred to as the principal architect of the universe. Now, where does that sound familiar? Yeah. You know, and Freemasonry and stuff like that. So I, I, I go on that whole tangent in the book. I, I won't get too much into that here, but, um. Well, how does that uh, play into, um, Vishnu's place at CERN? Oh, yeah. Um, well, that, yeah, that, that's skipping ahead a little bit, uh, <laughs> which, which is totally fine. I, I, I have a whole section in that chapter about Vishnu. Uh, well, well, Vishnu, he, he was, uh, the, uh, Hindu deity of preservation and what makes, what makes this, you know, false god or god lower? I'm just going to say god just for sake of being brief, but you know, just understand when I say it. I lowercase g. Uh, but what makes this god so interesting is uh, the various avatars. Um, you know, he he has ten avatars, and they're called the the Dasha Vatara, and they're described in um, the Purana Bihar- Parana B- Bharati, excuse me. And, uh, you. you know, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it said that, uh, nine of, nine of those avatars have already occurred in the past and the final avatar is going to occur in the, you know, future. It's, it's their, that's their, their eschatology. Um, and, uh, well, what's interesting is all those avatars were actually, you know, there's 10 of them. I list them all out in the book. There's, uh, there's the fish, the tortoise, the boar, the half man, half lion, which that's really interesting with Ezekiel. Okay. Um, Hold that. Oh, thought. yep. Well, I'm your host, Rob Skiba, and we're talking with Josh Peck about his book, Cherubim Chariots. And, uh, right before the break, you were describing the various avatars of Vishnu. Why don't you yeah. continue with that thought? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, this is, this is, uh, you know, this is really interesting that you brought up CERN with, with this because it, it actually has a lot to do with it. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, a, a, as I was saying that, uh, man, where does the time go? I can't believe it's been an hour already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, it, it, it's believed that nine of these avatars have already happened and, and there's still one to come. And you know, what's, what's really interesting is, uh, in 1877, uh, Helena Blavatsky, you know, she published her, uh, book, uh, Isis Unveiled, and she actually interpreted the Dashavataras, or those, those avatars, as representing the progression of biological evolution. So that shows what kind of influence, you know, they have. And, um, she, she lists out each, each avatar, 
uh, you know, the, like the first one's the fish, and she says that, you know, that that's the first class of vertebrates that evolved in water, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. She goes through this whole thing. And then the last one, the one that's supposedly to come, which is called Kalki, uh, she uh, she wrote that it, it it's symbolizing advanced humans with great powers of destruction. Now, what's interesting about uh, why Vishnu's in, you know, connected with this whole CERN thing, whether they, whether, whether the people that are operating that know that they're doing this or not, it, it might just be demonically inspired or they might full well know what they're doing. Uh, I, I believe that they're trying to bring in this 10th, um, th- this last incarnation and, uh, th- this final incarnation, Kalki, it's, uh, it's understood as the, the final incarnation of Vishnu. And it, it said that he, he will ride a white horse with a sword that blazes like a comet. That already mm. uh, that that already sounds a lot like Revelation, but it also sounds like uh, the Islamic end time figure that is sometimes uh, compared with you know the the Antichrist, the the Mahdi, the uh, especially con- concerning the the white horse and also um, you know the biblical Antichrist. If you take that interpretation of the first horse, meaning that which you know I'm still on the fence about, but uh, some do, and I, I get where that comes from, but. Uh, you know, that's described as the rider of the white horse in, in chapter six of the book Revelation. It has the same, the same type of characteristics. Uh, so I believe that whole opening dimensional doorways thing, it, it, whatever, however the end time figure is going to incarnate or however that's going to happen, I, I think that that's what that symbolizes there and why that's, why that specifically is there at CERN. What are they up to these days? I haven't kept up with them, but I've just been hearing rumblings uh, here and there that they are firing things up and more powerful and yada yada. What have you followed up on it at all? Have you been paying attention? Yeah, that, that that that's basically about all I've heard too. There's not a whole lot of information. I've been I've been looking to see. You know, the only thing I've really been able to find is that they're basically what you just said. They're planning on. Uh, firing it up soon and it's going to be bigger and more powerful and, and what exactly that means what they're going to do what they're looking for I'm, I'm not sure i don't think a whole lot of that has been disclosed yet but um yeah i i, I definitely try to keep up on it because it's you know it's interesting and uh you know I, I think that it plays at least some type of end times uh role i'm not sure exactly what but that might be uh that might be what what's used to to bring all this stuff into into our dimension you know it, at one one of the ways. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, 2,053 nuclear bombs, if I remember the number right, were nuclear bombs have been exploded on this planet uh, since the 40s. Wow. And uh, that prompted me uh, in, in my research for Archon Invasion Part 2 uh, to believe that – and there were physicists and there were different people saying, you know, all this nuclear activity, I mean, we are renting – holes we're tearing the fabric of time and space yeah and you know if you think about that 2053 nuclear bombs uh and most of them exploded by the united states of america and incidentally and a whole lot of them in the area 51 nevada you know and and um new mexico white sands you know that whole uh southwest area of the united states do do you think that these all this nuclear activity and CERN and things of that nature are strategically located and, and these th- things were taking place at specific locations for specific reasons to bring back extra dimensional entities. Yeah, I, I believe so. I mean, it's, it's definitely possible. And, and again, whether they, whether the ones in charge of, of handling all that, whether they consciously know it or not, cause it might, you know, they might be doing it in ignorance. It could be a demonically influenced thing, but, but they very well might know exactly what they're doing, uh, which seems to be the case. Uh, you know, at least, at least the higher ups do. Well, when you um, have characters like Jack Parsons and stuff, yeah, what they were into, you're like, okay, well, they were, you know, when, when you got Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard doing the uh, Babylon working in the area that now became known as Area 51, you know, later, yep. they clearly had some kind of willful intent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, that's why, uh, you know, that's that's another way that these these doorways are being ripped open is is through the occult, uh, through all these occult practices. You know, there, there are a lot of skeptics, you know, especially in our culture that, 
believe that there just really isn't anything to magic or witchcraft and you know they're just wasting their time but all uh, that that stuff is real it's it's real it's demonic it's evil and you know there's no such thing as uh you know a good witch or white magic it's it's all from the same evil source but those those types of things and even new age practices uh you know i've talked about probably every time i've been on your show <laughs> you know i've ta- i've mentioned astral projection and how i used to yeah wait long long before i was doing any of this when when i was still kind of an idiot i uh, <laughs> i used to you know practice in that stuff not at all knowing what i was doing i mean i i looking back on it i can see how i was being demonically influenced mm-hmm. uh but i i had no idea what i was doing but every time that i was successful i i, I was ripping open a a a, a, a doorway or a portal between between dimensions I didn't know it at the time until stuff started spilling through and, you know, terrorizing my family and I. And, you know, that's a whole other story. But uh, and, and, you know, it was just by the the authority and name of Jesus that those portals were able to be closed. But, yeah, I mean, uh, things like that, you know, they're not innocent. You know, I mean, a lot I used to think. You know, well, I'm not hurting anybody by doing this, but actually I was. I was hurting myself and my family. I just, I just didn't know it. Same goes for all, you know, occult practices. Uh, and that, that is, that is a way that these doorways are, are opened as well as j- just like what, uh, Jack Parsons and, uh, uh, Alistair Crowley and, you know, people like that were, were, were trying to do. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm. In chapter three, you talk about ancient technology. Uh, you know, in antiquity and the inception of extra dimensional technology. W- would you say, uh, the Tower of Babel was the first such structure in the post flood world? Yeah, in the post flood world, definitely. And, um, do you, you know, know, I, the way you answered that, um, <laughs> in the post flood world, definitely. Uh, do you believe that the Tower of Babel was built on top of a pre flood structural? Um, in 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 a in an area where there was some kind of pre flood activity, there was there was something special about that area. I, I don't know exactly what it was, but there was some reason that they built it there of all places. And, and you know, like you you've even commented on they they had mountains all around. If it was just yeah. about height, they could have you know you, they could have utilized that. But they built it in a in a valley. So I I believe there was something special about that location. Exactly what it was, I I don't know. Uh, but I, I do believe that it, it's possible there was some some type of pre-flood thing that that happened there, um, or or that might you know maybe if it was uh, a technological thing, uh, there might have been something left over that they utilized in the you know in the in the building. Or I I, I can only really speculate, <laughs> but yeah, I, I believe that's a strong possibility. Okay, so you got Nimrod and company, and and they decide okay. For whatever reason, this location's ideal to build something in the post-flood world. Uh, take it from there. What 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 do you think is going on there with the planes? Well, I, I think that they I think that they were tr- most likely trying to call back the uh, the fallen angels or you know the extra dimensional beings. Uh, Book of Enoch talks a lot, or, or uh, Jasher, excuse me. Book of Jasher, talk, well Enoch too, but <laughs> especially Jasher talks a lot about that uh, and gives a lot more information as to what what exactly was going on um but it, it seems like they were trying to petition the fallen angels and um you know what, what's really interesting about that let me find my uh i gotta find my notes on this real quick uh about the tower of babel um was what happened afterwards uh and, and it, i think that it it really describes why we're in the position we're in today um you, you know because i i think a lot of skeptics of our type of research ask, well, you know, if these things are angels or if these things are demons, what would they care about our affairs? You know, why would they, why would they want to deceive an entire nation and, you know, do all, do all these things? Um, how did they get into a position where they could do such a thing? I, I actually think that in a way, uh, in a roundabout kind of way, probably not in the way that he had in mind. I, I think Nimrod was successful, but, uh, Again, in more of an ironic kind of way, you know, I, I as I said before, I, I believe that Nimrod and the, the people of the world were trying to call back these fallen angels um, and uh, really to, to try in their attempt to destroy God and, you know, set up set up their own gods in, in God's place. 
Uh, but what ended up happening, you know, is kind of kind of ironic. Uh, and th- th- this was really what got me away from the whole. I-, I used to be, you know, years ago, I used to be like King James only, and, and this was one of the things that was brought to my attention that kind of got me out of that mindset and more accepting of other Bible translations. Um, Deuteronomy 32, 8, it, it's translated in the King James as uh, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Yeah, which um, didn't show up till hundreds of years later. <laughs> exactly, and that that's the issue, is that last the last word of that passage there is sons of Israel. And, and really, it should be translated as uh, the sons of God, and the ESV has it that way. It, yep. The ESV says, uh, when the Most High gave to their nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. So that translation, and I believe it's in the Septuagint and things like that too, yeah. um, but that that translation seems to make more sense when we consider the context of what what's being talked about it's it's talking about when god divided mankind which refers back to the tower of babel that's when that happened the main reason the sons of god translation makes more sense than sons of israel is as you pointed out the, at that time uh there you know right after the tower of babel there was no israel there were no children to be numbered uh but there definitely were sons of god or, or you know what we would call angels um so the short version of that story states that uh you know the people of the world led by nimrod built the tower in attempt somehow an attempt to uh enter heaven or and or petition the fallen angels uh they worshiped those fallen angels as their gods so so when when God when Yahweh uh, dispersed the the people and confused their languages, he did so according to the number of the fallen angels that were worshipped instead of him. Uh, and you know some some sources I think Jasher says there were seventy. Yeah. Uh, so it it's it's basically as if uh, God was saying, okay, you don't want to worship me, but you want these fallen angels as your gods. Then you can have them over you in your own nations, and let's see how how well that works out for you. Yeah. Um, but but you know the good the the really cool thing about our God, about Yahweh, is that uh, he he's always offered free will to humans and always provided a way for humans to return to him if they so cho- if they so chose. So if that's the correct translation, that that could help explain um, really the origin of all the world's religions, why there's so many different ones. It it could explain why uh, all other religions offer salvation by personal works, yet biblical texts. Uh, states that we can't attain our salvation, uh, you know, on our own. We're in need of a savior. Um, that could help explain the, the purpose of the formation of Israel. That, that, that verse immediately following what we looked at, uh, it, uh we, we looked at Deuteronomy 30, 32, 8. Deuteronomy 32, 9 says, but the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is allotted heritage. So, the the the, tra- the uh, interpretation or translation of sons of God really just brings the whole thing together. Um, you know, God gave His people the of the world or gave the people of the world what they wanted to you know they wanted to worship false and inferior gods. Yet uh, He still had a plan for people to return if they if they would choose to do so. And that plan began with God taking His portion, Israel, beginning with Abraham, and later being born in the same lineage as. Uh, you know, as, as their saviors, the savior of the the people of the world required for eternal salvation, or you know, Jesus Christ. So, I mean, it, it's it's phenomenal how one little thing <laughs> like that, uh, one word really from Israel and God can uh, really change the whole uh, context of the verse and bring everything into sharper focus. Uh, but yeah, so that's. Yeah, that's that's that. <laughs> you know, I I I looked at it as because you know many uh, ancient scholars and rabbis and whatnot have uh, said that the languages were dispersed to seventy different people groups. And again, going back to Michael Heiser, he talks about the uh, divine council of, yeah. of seventy, and that okay, the so okay, here we go. We're going to split up everybody into seventy. And Joshua said there's about six hundred thousand men on the planet at that time. So you've got theoretically maybe a million, couple million people on the earth, uh, are going to be separated in, uh, into 70 different people groups. And it's, as I read that, 
and same thing, you know, Septuagint, look at all these other ones, sons of God, sons of God, of course, King James says sons of Israel. I'm going, what? But it appears that, uh, kind of piggyback on, um, Eli Marzulli's concept of a cosmic chess match, that God basically said, okay, let's divide them up into 70. I'll tell you what, Satan, you take 69, and I'll take, uh, Eber and his group, uh, for myself. Yeah. Give it your best shot. <laughs> <laughs> 69 to 1, give it your best shot. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, and, and, and of course you got all the different religions and different things that spun off from those 69. Meanwhile, God's just kind of playing with this one little group, the, the Hebrews, and calls Abraham out and, you know, the rest of the story, uh, from there. But, uh, it is fascinating. So do you think that, it, you know, if there's nothing new under the sun and what has been will be again, do you think that we're going to see a revisitation of a Babel-like scenario and where God says, okay, you want to play around with the fallen ones? Here you go. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe that's even talked about in Zechariah, uh, chapter five. Um, when, uh, that, that actually gets into the whole scroll and ephah thing. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, I, I always thought that that was really interesting. I, I think, I think some people, uh, you know, I, I've, I've read a lot of different interpretations and everything, but I, I, I think, I, I think some kind of missed the mark a little bit. And, you know, I'm not saying I have it all together or anything, because I, I certainly don't. I'm as flawed and human as the rest of them, but, uh, uh, if not worse so. But, um, you know, a lot of people will look at the description of the scroll and they'll see, you know, a cigar shaped UFO there. I, I personally don't. I, I think that that's, that that's a vision you know it's i believe it's a literal scroll with a, an actual meaning um that I, I you know on the surface doesn't really have much of anything to do with uh ufos i mean it, it, you know in in context you know when you dig deeper into it, it there might be something there but with the efa though i i do think that that's representing uh a, a type of a craft yeah. and um and and it directly relates back to Babel. Uh, the vision of the uh, the Ifa. Let's see. Uh, this is a lot to read. Um, well, let's see. It, it's in Zechariah. Uh, chapter, we're still yeah, chapter five, verses five through eleven. I won't read all of it, but um, it basically says that you know there's an Ifa that goes forth, and this is their resemblance throughout all the earth. That's what the the uh, angel is telling Zechariah. Um, and uh, it's described as wickedness. He says that this is uh, there's a woman that sits in the the middle of the Ifa, and the angel says this is wickedness, and he cast it into the midst of the Ifa, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Um, and also interesting is it says that there are these two uh these two women the wind was in their wings for they had wings like the wings of a stork and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and heaven um and th this is where it's really interesting Zechariah asked the angel you know where where are these women taking this ephah and uh the angel says to build it a house in the land of Shinar right. and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Yeah. Um so that that right there connects right back to and and the reason that I believe the reason I think it's this ephah thing, you know, if you look at a picture of what an ephah looked like, I, it does resemble, you know, the flying saucer shape type of UFO. Um just in appearance and it, you know it does say in the verse this is their appearance throughout the all all the earth. Uh, so the reason, I, I believe that it, it's set in that place in Shinar because that, that was, uh, in antiquity, that was the place of the original deception of the, these fallen, of the return of these, these fallen angels. So I believe that that's going to be revisited somehow. And I believe it's going to have something to do with the whole UFO phenomenon, alien gospel. I, I don't know exactly what or how it's all going to play out. I don't know if it's going to be, uh, like, like how Ellie Merzulli describes basically one day all these UFOs are going to show up. It could be that, or it might be something more gradual, like what, uh, Doug Woodward describes. It might, might be more gradual and subtle of a process. I, I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but, uh, I, I do believe that those are the elements that are going to be involved in, in that deception. Um, uh, and that, that's how it, that's how it ties back to, uh, back to Shinar and the Tower of Babel, because they, they were trying to do the same thing. They were trying to call call back, uh, you know, the fallen angels, and we're doing that today. They, they might have a different name, you know, the world will call them extraterrestrials or aliens, but, uh, you know, there, there are even reports of um, 
occultists conjuring uh, gray aliens. And, and you know, if if they're an extraterrestrial being, what how how can you conjure? How would like, how would that work yeah, anyway? It, how, are they just sitting around walking around uh, Zeta Reticuli and all of a sudden? <laughs> Oh, they get yanked out of their planet and manifest in your living room. I mean, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, actually, oh, here, here's here's a creepy thing. I uh, I just got I was just contacted by somebody. Um, I, I won't mention her name, but it's somebody that I've talked to. You know, I, I keep in contact with uh, one of my one of my readers, and um, I've, I've had contact with this individual for a year, maybe 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 a couple years now, um, and. Uh, uh, you know, it's just real basic stuff. You know, if, if she has a question, she'll ask and I'll do my best to answer that kind of stuff. Well, the other night, uh, she, she asked if, uh, she asked what I knew, like, like if I knew anything about like casting demons out or something like that. And because she said that a friend of hers, um, is being oppressed by, by demons and it, it, it's definitely demonic. And she talked to me a little bit about it and I said, well, and, and you know, she basically said, she told me what she was telling her, you know, using the name of Jesus and all that. And I said, yeah, you're on the right track. And she said, well, here's the weird thing. Uh, my, my friend actually snapped a picture of one of these things through, through a window. It, I guess she was woken up by, by tapping on the window and, um, she got the, her camera on her phone and, and took a picture to, you know, get a picture of this thing she sent she she sent me the picture and you can see a reflection in the glass of what looks like a gray alien and i i you know i've seen i've seen so many fake pictures and hoaxes you know i'm not an expert and i'm sure that there are some that are really good that you know that i would even be fooled by but i i do not think this is one i don't believe at all that this this is an elaborate hoax um uh, for one thing, I don't really see uh, uh, any benefit, you know, uh, because um, this this friend of the person that was talking to me uh, has no idea that I'm even in the picture, you know. So yeah. what would be what would be the benefit? Uh, but yeah, she 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 sent me this picture, and I looked at it, and I just got a chill up and down my spine, and I, I was like, that that. <laughs> I don't understand how the world can look at something like that and think alien and not demon. <laughs> you know, okay. I, it, it, it's just intense. So that that's kind of that, that's kind of a, a tangent, but <laughs> I just thought that was kind of interesting in what we're what we're talking about. But uh, yeah, and, and you know, descriptions of demons, you either get like the typical like shadow people, like what what you you and I have have dealt with and we've talked about, or a lot of times when people describe demons. They describe what the world would see as aliens, and then they say, "Oh, well, you were abducted by aliens. That that's not a demon. That's an alien. Maybe that's what demons look like, or fallen angels. Even you know, I, I believe they're two different things. But uh, so I, I, you know, that, that's where really why I wanted to deal with this whole extra dimensional thing, and um, to show that not only the craft are extra dimensional, but the creatures themselves are extra dimensional. That's how they're able to, you know, pull a person like a, a three dimensional solid person through a three dimensional solid wall. Uh, uh, only something that originates from a higher dimension has access to be able to do things like that. Uh, so, but yeah, I kind of went off on a little bit of a tangent there. <laughs> no, that's great stuff, man. Um, well, you've, well, we got about a minute and a half before we go to break, but, uh, when we come back, you, uh, you've talked about sort of the connection, uh, or reconnection as it were possibly with, uh, the plains of Shinar and Babylon. Uh, but you've got a section, it looks like in chapter three, where you talk about the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx. Yeah. So, uh, are you implying an, an Egyptian connection as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that and then do not let me forget. I'll, I'll go through that briefly because I want to tell you about the topographical spacemen. You're, you're, you're going to love this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, cool. So, um, we'll talk about the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid and kind of your take on that. Uh, and then, uh, what, what do you mean by topographical spaceman? What, what, what is, what does the phrase mean? You can describe it more afterwards. Yeah, it's, uh, well, basically, if you, if you, you know the Nazca lines? Oh. Okay. Um, you, you know the one, uh, the, the one that's called the giant sometimes, or, yeah. you know, it's called the spaceman? Well, yeah. that, that, you know, that was made by man. That's a, that's man made. There are images like that that are naturally made. <laughs> really? Yeah, and, uh, it, it's, it, the, the, this, I was apprehensive to even include this in the book because it's so out there. It's so weird. But 
I, I do believe that there's something something there, and I put images in the book. I, I'll I'll get all into detail when we get back from the break, but uh, uh, I, I know you with with the research that you've done, you, you'll really appreciate it. Okay, well, very good. We'll go to break right now, and we'll come back on the final section of the broadcast. We'll talk about topographical space. Break. You uh, sort of teased us with this idea <laughs> of topographical space, man. There's actually four questions. I want you to see if you can possibly try to get to as best you can <laughs> um, in this last segment. The first is dealing with uh, Egypt's pyramids and Sphinx. Second, the topographical spaceman. And uh, what does Mount Hermon have to, and Roswell have to do with Orion? And then finally, uh, we'll, we'll let people know where we can get your books. Yeah, absolutely. There's so much information. It's gonna. I'll, I'll do my best to pack it into a half hour. But uh, you know, it, it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, it, and it, it's so interesting and fascinating. Well, a, a good place to before we get into the spaceman stuff uh, is uh, the whole Egypt thing because it's it's a little shorter. I mean, actually, you could do a whole study on just that, and you have, so you know. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, Spe- spe- actually, speaking about that, did you end up getting that uh, that that book I recommended to you, the the by Noah Hutchings, the the Great Pyramid? I, I did. Yes, I did. I, Good. I, I got it uh, probably a week or two after I did my uh, my conference on the subject, um, and then uh, I just said, okay, I'm going to put it in. When actually, no, I uh, I got it right before I did the conference because I actually referred to it during the conference. Oh, awesome! Yeah, I'm I'm glad that you got that because uh, I remember the last time you were on my show, uh, we just barely. Th- this was when you were still looking in. I, I think you had a, yeah, uh, just the first the, part, the blog, the blog. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I remembered uh, that that book, and I thought, oh, that'd be perfect. And but yeah, I'm glad I'm glad that you got it and was able to to reference it. I, I referenced it in the in the presentation. Awesome. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. I, uh, I referenced it as well in, in my book. Cause that, it's a, it's a little book, but it's, it's just filled with information. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah. So getting to that, that whole thing. Um, so, you know, we, we know from Enoch and Genesis that before the flood, the fallen angels, you know, brought all these sorts of, you know, wisdom and secrets. And, uh, you know, you could even say technology. Um, Enoch says things like, uh, you know, Semyaza taught enchantments and root cutting and Amorosa resolving of enchantments. And, you know, it goes through that whole list. Uh, so we, we know where that, that originally that's where those come from. Um, but w- what's really interesting is that, that uh, Josephus actually talked, says, something about that and give some more information um josephus writes uh they the meaning the children of seth uh also were the inventors of that peculiar sort of wisdom which is concerned with the heavenly bodies and their order um and that their inventions might not be lost before they were sufficiently known upon adam's prediction that the world was to be destroyed at one time by the force of fire and at another time by the violence and quantity of water they made two pillars one of brick the other of stone they inscribed <clears throat> their discoveries on them both in, that in case the pillar of brick should be destroyed by the flood the pillar of stone might remain and exhibit those discoveries to mankind and also inform them that there was another pillar of brick erected by them. Now this remains in the land of Syria or Egypt to this day. So even in the day of Josephus, that that remained there. Um, now in, in Jubilees, it, it, it says, uh, it, it kind of builds a little bit from that, and it says, and he, meaning Canaan, uh, found a writing which former generations had carved on the rock, and he read what was thereon, and he transcribed it and sinned owing to it, for it contained the teaching of the watchers in accordance with which they used to observe the omens of the sun and moon and stars and all the signs of heaven. So if all those accounts are to be taken as factual, that might help fill in some blanks um, and uh, answer some interesting questions about the Sphinx and uh, Great Pyramid. Um, now, when we just take the, the that account of Josephus and Jubilees, there's not like a a whole lot of information given about those pillars of the children of Seth. You know, we're told that there were two pillars, one of brick and one of stone. Um, they weren't sure if the pillar of brick would be destroyed by the flood. So in case it was, they built the pillar of stone and inscribed their discoveries on both. Uh, we're told that at least 
the pillar of stone remained in Egypt, at least in the days of Josephus. Um, we're also told that those uh, pillars contained the teachings of the watchers, and it was considered uh, sinful to follow those teachings. So that begs the question, is there anything in Egypt that uh, that we might be able to compare to this? Um, now, this is speculative, and uh, but I think it's still interesting. Um, I'm not saying that this is historical or scientific or anything. This is just kind of me thinking uh, in, in my own book, so I'm allowed to do that. But uh, <laughs> there's a, I, I believe that there's a possibility that the two pillars could actually be um, the Great Pyramid, or at least the capstone, and what is now the Great Sphinx in Egypt. Um Author and researcher Robert M. Schock has postulated, uh, due to the evidence of water erosion, that the Great Sphinx in Giza is actually far older than most would suspect, and that a catastrophe of some kind destroyed any other evidence of an older civilization. Uh, his research was uh, showcased in the 1993 documentary uh, Mystery of the Sphinx, uh, which was actually presented by Charlton Heston. It's a pretty interesting uh, documentary. People want to check that out. It's uh, free on YouTube. That's where I find, found it. Um, but in, in that documentary, the idea is put forth that the Sphinx was originally nothing more than uh, a large natural stone jutting from the earth. And an unknown civilization saw the stone and decided to carve into it, yet what they carved originally is also unknown. Um so after the unknown civilization was destroyed, a new civilization arrived and carved the stone into the figure of a head, and then also a body was dug out and formed, you know, from the ground underneath, and that's how the, the Sphinx was created. Um, so that's that's uh, that's Shock's research. He's not coming at this from a biblical perspective or anything like that. That's just uh, what he's, you know, based on the water erosion and things like that. So if there's any validity to that, that might help explain the pillar of stone that. Um, contained the teaching of the wa the watchers it's possible that the the stone that was found originally the just the natural stone jutting from the earth was uh inscribed with those teachings and then the flood came later civilizations then for reasons unknown maybe because of what Canaan did whatever he did uh later civilizations removed the inscriptions by carving the stone down to the image of of the head of, of the sphinx and uh then they could have created the body to form a complete cherub like statue and that, you know that's what we're looking at it's it, it's a cherub <laughs> in order to protect something because you know as we talked about earlier that's that's the job of of the uh, cherub to protect something and it might have been to protect those secrets with whatever Canaan did to sin uh, you know, according to OC, it was something bad enough um, for at least for it to be recorded in, in, in Jubilees and things. But uh, so that that might that could be the pillar of stone. Now, the pillar of brick might be the Great Pyramid, but specifically the missing capstone. Um, now, there's a lot of information and speculation that could be, you know, looked at in regards to the Great Pyramid, and, and you certainly have done way more than I have in, in that area. And it, it's from from what I've heard in your presentation, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, but we we could look at that. There there is a theory that uh, the Great Pyramid could be made of brick and not not uh, quarried from from stone and if uh, the builders were unsure if it would survive the flood it might make sense that they would inscribe the teaching of the watchers at the very top or the capstone um, now stating that the great pyramid is made from brick and not quarried stone is controversial uh, but there there is some good research into that and some good uh, explanations on, on why people believe that and I include a, a link to a blog in the book um, but anyway so that uh, now, what exactly happened to the capstone, whether why it's missing today or if it's still in existence somewhere, um, that's up for debate. But it, it might have been carried away with the flood and buried somewhere in the ocean. You know, who knows? But uh, so now when we're you know talking about possibilities like that, there's a lot of theories. <laughs> but uh, I, I do believe that some truth can be found somewhere in between all those theories. And at the very least, it's an, it's intriguing. It's interesting. Um, there's a wide variety of resources, you know, your, your work and, uh, and also, uh, what the book I mentioned before, the great pyramid, uh, prophecy in stone by Noah Hutchings is a, is a great resource, but that in a nutshell is, uh, how the, 
uh, pyramid and Sphinx might connect to those those two pillars. Okay. Um, yeah, I met Robert Shock. He's a he's a really cool guy. Actually, he's a really down to earth guy. We had a lot of um, very interesting conference. He was one of the speakers at that conference I was at in New Jersey. Oh, awesome! So we we spent quite a bit of time together uh, at the host's house and um, uh, out at restaurants and stuff like that. We had a lot of uh, interesting conversations. Uh, but he's just a really cool guy. Um, all right, so uh, topographical spacemen. Yeah, yeah. So this was something that I, I didn't really know that it was this research was going to take this turn until it did. I I originally was just looking into the Nazca lines because I I know that that is used in ancient astronaut theory, you know, as as evidence to support it. Uh, and I I just wanted to look into it and see what was you know just see what what was there. But basically, the Nazca lines they're they're in southern Peru. They're north of the town of Nazca. And they're, it's an expanse of desert that has um. Uh, geoglyphs. Uh, they're just basically really large images, uh, in, in the, that are carved into the terrain. Um, you know, they, they depict different types of animals, like there, there's a monkey and a hummingbird and a spider. Uh, and, and they seem to be best, it, it seems to be that they're best seen from the sky. Uh, but there's one that has had a lot of special attention because uh, it, it, it's a humanoid figure. It's called the spaceman. Sometimes it's called the giant, which I think is interesting. Um, but, uh, ancient astronaut theory will say that, um, you know, it, it, it is showing an alien of some kind. Cause, you know, it, it does look kind of weird. It has an oddly shaped head. You know, there, there's, there's features of it. And there's a lot of speculation, uh, for why the original crafters of those geoglyphs would include that strange design. Um, but, uh, I, I include pictures of all this stuff in the book, uh, to actually, sh basically it, it looks like it's a humanoid figure with a vertical line running from its feet to, uh, the bottom of its head. And it has its, its right arm raised, its left arm is down and it has a really strange shaped head. Like it, it, it's, it's just this weird, like kind of bulbous head with two, two big eyes, um, People can look up, you know, NASCA Spaceman and get pictures of it, you know. Uh, but anyway, so keep that in mind. Um, now, this actually, th this is something that I uh, – builds off of some of your research that I uh, first saw years ago um, in uh, – I don't remember. I, I think it was the yeah the Mount Hermon Roswell connection. Your uh, mm -hmm. your your presentation DVD. You you had a um, you had a picture of Mount Hermon on there, and you showed how the uh and you, you just you just briefly you know just mentioned it, but you showed how the top the topography of Mount Hermon actually has the shape of a goat's head. Yeah. And uh you know and then you talked about Azazel and. And all that stuff in connection with that and how that was the site of the, the, uh, the original 200 watchers that, you know, that, that whole thing. Um, I, I, I thought that, that, I thought that was pretty interesting. And, um, you know, when I, when I find a researcher I like or like, you know, a DVD or something, I, I, I have the, the bad habit of watching it over and over and over and over again. <laughs> and that, that was, that was the DVD that I did that with. And, uh, just over time, um, that, that image, uh, you know, I, I, I saw the, the goat head and, and, you know, I referenced that in, in, in the book, but I also saw something else in there too. Um, and I, it, when I first noticed it, I really didn't know what to do with it. And I did, I did, I really didn't even pay any attention to it for a couple of years because I thought it was just too speculative. Um, but if you look at, uh, it, 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 people who want to look at the coordinates of this, it's in Google Earth. It's, uh, uh, 30, 33 degrees, 27, 38.21 north and 36 degrees, uh, 04, 29.65 east. That's where you can see this thing. Um, if you look at, if you look at like just the top part of the head where, uh, where it's, I, I guess it would be its ear, um, kind of sticks out. When you look at, the ear itself, it actually has facial features. <laughs> and if you, if you zoom in on it, you, you, it's, it, to me, it, it looks like an elongated skull. And, you know, there's two eyes, a mouth, and a, there's even a nose. And then, um, 
the the goat head itself has a, a darkened shaded area on the top that actually forms this thing's body and um you know when i first noticed that like i said i didn't really know what to do with it i i didn't i i thought it was just too speculative but when uh when i research when well okay the 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 main important thing too is that uh, in this, in that shaded area, the body of this thing, its right arm is raised. So when I was looking into Nazca, you know, a couple years later after I f- saw that, that reminded me of the right arm being raised thing. And I, I, I thought that, you know, I was like, well, that's an interesting coincidence. I'm not sure if there's enough there. So I, you know, I, in your DVD and, uh, and I know Dave, Dave Flynn, um, made, did a lot of extensive research into this, into a connection between uh, Mount Hermon and Roswell. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, well, there's a good way to test if there's anything there. If, if there's, I I do believe that there is a connection between those two places. If there really, you know, if there really is this naturally made spaceman thing that looks a lot like the one in Peru, except it has an elongated skull, there should be one in Roswell too. And it should be, noticeable um so i looked at uh on google earth i looked at the topography of roswell and i you know i wish i wish you had a a video show so i could show these images because they're uh, well i'm on google earth right now okay got a location for me yeah okay roswell new mexico it's uh 33 degrees uh 49 to 1.98 north and then 103 degrees 57, uh, 49.23 west. Um, so Roswell should be at that, like the bottom portion, you know, of the screen. And if you look up, uh, stand, you know, standing above Roswell, it looks like there, there's this topographical image of, uh, a, what looks to me like a little gray alien with its right arm raised. And I have, uh, you know, I have the outline, um, are, if you, uh, follow the, the, I think it's a river or something, uh, from Roswell, you follow that up, that forms the, uh, the left side of its body. And, and from there, I mean, it's, it's pretty prominent. I mean, there's even big eyes in this thing. Um, are, 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 are you there? Are you able to uh, see it? I got Roswell uh, highlighted there, and then up above that is some dark green uh, pastures and agricultural stuff. You might have to zoom out a lot. North uh, Airport. Let me see if I can find what the altitude was. I should have recorded that. Um, yeah, you, you, you probably you, you probably have to zoom out quite a bit. Uh, let me see here. I'm, I'm going to try to. I'm going to try to find the. Oh, that's, I, the the altitude is. I can't quite make it out. I'm at 35.69. Let me let me try to zoom in here. I, I should. I I have this image on my other. Oh wait, actually, no, I do have it on this laptop. Let me uh let me pull it up real quick so I can actually see what the altitude is. Um. Because it, it's one of those things. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. <laughs> Uh, okay, let me. Google Earth is fun, man. Oh yeah, I I, I like I like playing around on that. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, Roswell. Of course, it's kind of like looking at clouds. You know, you can kind of see like you know. All right. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, elevation is uh, four thousand two hundred and seventy nine feet. I altitude is one sixty point six nine miles. One sixty six nine. Oh, you're way out. Yeah, yeah, you gotta zoom out quite a bit. It's big. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I see like the river going up. Yeah, if you see, if you, that, that forms the left side of its body and especially where it curves out, um, that, that's its, that's its head. Uh, mm. and if you, if you follow that around, it, it, it actually form, you know, it, uh, forms the shape of his head and then you can see it's it's right arm is is raised i i have an outline uh i have an outline of it in the book like i have a picture of just the just the natural topography and then i have an outline of it that shows in a little bit more a little bit more detail um but uh, yeah and uh and if you actually look inside of the head too you can even see two uh two eyes um are, are you able to are, 
Are you seeing what I'm seeing? <laughs> oh well, I don't, I'm not sure that I am, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to take up too much of your time trying to figure oh, this okay. out. So you can you <laughs> can send me pictures on Facebook or whatever later. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, but, I even I even have them. Um, I even have the pictures in my blog. Uh, Josh Peck Disclosure Blogspot com. Scroll down to the topographical spaceman, and you, you can even see some pictures there. I have some of the information uh, for that chapter for that chapter in that blog, uh, but I have way more in the actual chapter itself. Uh, anyway, but yeah, going back to the what that actually ties to uh, Reliant, uh, Orion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so once I saw those those details, and, and I, you know, I, I wanted to test myself to make sure I just wasn't seeing things. You know, I wanted to make sure I was actually there. So I sent it to some other people that I trust. You know, other researchers, and they, you know, they they saw it too. And uh, I looked in other areas where I, I thought. Maybe there would be something, you know, I, I looked at the, the, uh, site of the Phoenix light, didn't find anything. Um, I looked other, other UFO sites. I found nothing. I, I must have looked in 20 different. So I even looked on, uh, uh, on the Mars, uh, on Mars and on the moon and stuff. Nothing. Yeah. So, you know, after I didn't find, I was like, okay, I'm, maybe I'm not just seeing things here because it seems like I'd just be seeing them everywhere if I was. Uh, but anyway, so. The interesting thing is that there, there's one in, in, in Peru there that that's man-made. Um, but then there's the one in Roswell and the one in, uh, on Mount Hermon that are naturally made or, um, are made by something else. So what that has to do with, uh, Orion, um, I noticed a similarity of the Orion constellation and, these images orion's right arm is raised basically and uh, uh uh another interesting thing is it's not in a lot of star charts and stuff it isn't always mentioned but there's there's a star called the omega star that's right in the middle of uh of orion's uh, upper torso and if you follow that trail of stars down it actually bisects orion in half just like the the uh the Nazca that has the vertical line in, in, you know, in the spaceman itself, the vertical line. Um, so now how I think that connects is, uh, well, just besides the physical attributes, having the right arm raised and everything, I think that when we look at the history of what actually happened um, at Mount Hermon and Roswell, these are both times where something that I, I would say extra dimensional uh, came into contact with, uh, physical earth and humanity and really made, you know, made a big deal. Uh, you know, Roswell was huge. And of course, Mount Hermon was as well. I, I think Orion, the Orion constellation, um, is a, a type of prophecy of another time that this is going to happen in the future. But this time it's going to bring the, the, the end time figure, the, the Antichrist figure. Uh, maybe a reincarnation of Nimrod because, uh, and this also goes in line with your research and what we talked about before, the, the division of the languages, they, the nations would have called Nimrod by different names. Uh, Orion's one of them. So I, I believe that this might be a, a prophetic statement in the stars. And then I, I wrote a whole chapter on prophecies in the stars and things actually. So there's validity there, um, that shows a return of, not only extra dimensional beings, but also of, uh, of the, the end time antichrist figure. And I, I, I believe that there, those images are, are imprinted in the topography because that's where those happened and having the same right arm raised as, uh, as, as Orion, I believe that, that, you know, that's a prophetic warning. Um, that this is going to happen again. Uh, now, why the right arm is raised and why the bisecting line? You know, I can only speculate. I, I think that the the line that bisects it might have something to do with uh, with like a hybrid of some sort. You know, part human, part possibly extra dimensional or you know alien kind of thing. Uh, and there's a lot of different theories about that. Um, I, I, why the right arm is raised, uh, I, I believe might have something to do with paying homage to this thing or showing allegiance. Uh, and, and you know, I mean, uh, you, you could even look back to Hitler and the, the whole Nazi salute. Mm -hmm. The right arm was raised and, you know, I even put, have a picture in, uh, 
in the book of, of Hitler giving that salute, and he's wearing he's wearing a coat that you know that long coat that the line of the coat bisects his body in half. So it, you know it's just kind of interesting parallels. But uh, I and I do see Hitler as a um, a type or shadow of of Antichrist. I believe he was afflicted by the spirit of Antichrist. Uh, so all, all all those things put together, it's speculative, of course, but I, I think that it's pointing to something that's going to happen in, in probably our near future. All right. Well, we got uh, one minute left. So where can people uh, get your book and contact you uh, and look into your research? Absolutely. They can go to ministry.com. Uh, I have my book up on there. It's now available in uh, in ebook formats as well. Uh, and to get a hold of me, my email is joshpeckdisclosure at gmail.com. I highly encourage anybody to, to write me and get a hold of me. I, 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 I will answer back. <laughs> and also, I'm, uh, I'm really active on Facebook, probably more than I should be. <laughs> oh, there's that. There's that, too. <laughs> well, I know what that's like. Well, hey, Josh, thanks so much for coming on again. It was great talking with you.